Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Intel 471 webinar titled Busting a Myth, where we'll be looking at the overlap between nation state and financially motivated cybercrime. Um, my name is Moritz Lucas. I will be your host and presenter for this session. Um, and without further ado, we will, uh, we will get started. So in the next 40, 45 minutes, um, what I would like to cover with you is initially, we'll start off by setting the scene. Um, we'll talk a little bit about who we are at Intel 471 um, and what the cyber underground is actually like, which is important uh, because that understanding goes a long way to understanding why nation state and financially motivated actors overlap to the extent that they do. Um, we'll then start with a little prelude um, and go back, go back in time a little to see when did all of this actually start? And the hint is it started a lot earlier um, in time than many people actually realize. And we'll start this whole question about how, in, in, to what extent do nation state and cyber financially motivated actors overlap by revisiting a prediction uh, we made back in 2015 when we kind of first started seeing these two distinct types of activity um, in, in cyberspace, as it were. And that leads us to the myth that we want to bust today. Um, the myth that nation state and cybercrime are two separate things um, and that they are completely disjointed and there's no overlap between them. The truth um, is more nuanced. And so in that this part of the presentation, we'll look at some examples and some categories of where we see these two, two types of activity overlap. And we'll finish off by looking at why the understanding of this overlap is relevant um, in today's environment. And then we'll finish off with the summary and conclusions. So let's get started. Um, who are we at Intel 471? What do we do? Um, I think that will kind of understand what, what it is that we do um, goes some way to understanding why we, where the information we have on this overlap comes from. So Intel 471 is a cyber threat intelligence company. Um, we have, uh, what we do is we collect intelligence in what we call the cyber underground. Um, there's two main types of intelligence that we collect. Adversary intelligence, which is focused on what actors are talking about, um, their communications amongst each other, what they're discussing, what they're planning. And malware intelligence, which is focused on tracking the, the infrastructure and the tools um, that these actors use um, to kind of conduct their business or their activities. Now, we take that data and we split that into a number of different kind of lenses through which we look at the problem, adversary intelligence, vulnerability intelligence, and credential intelligence, helping, for instance, our customers with patching the right things at the right time, or helping to recover stolen accounts and compromised credentials so that um, customers can mitigate any risks that, that occur from those before the actual impact occurs. And we take this, these intelligence products and we provide them to customers in multiple industries around the globe. Now, the approach that we follow is what we call a boots on the ground model. Um, interestingly enough, even though you'd say this is cyber and you can do it from anywhere in the world, we found that to most kind of accurately track actor ecosystems to blend into the background, as it were, um, to the greatest extent, you need people that are actually located in the same rough geographical area as the actors that they are tracking. So we have researchers and analysts dotted around the globe in Eastern Europe, in Asia, um, in the Middle East, in South America, but also in Europe um, and North America as well. And by doing so, um, we help our customers mitigate risks by taking a more proactive stance when it comes to cyber risk. So the idea is, um, in the most reactive approach, you basically are concerned mostly with your own attack surface, trying to kind of build a wall, um, build a perimeter and stop anything from getting through. In today's world, however, that approach is often no longer sufficient and purely reactive, waiting for threats to materialize and then hoping uh, that the measures that you've taken are enough are no longer sufficient. So organizations want to become more proactive and get ahead of the curve. Um, and one of the ways in which you can do that, besides talking to organizations like yourselves, so talking collaborating or cooperating amongst the sector, is to move outside the perimeter and actually start looking at what the adversaries are up to. 
Um, a lot of focus traditionally has been placed on, tra on tracking technology, tracking technology, malware, botnets, for instance, and campaigns. But one of the key things you're, you'll be missing when you solely focus on the technology are basically they're twofold. One is those techno uh, technology characteristics change very, very quickly. IP addresses, locations where things are hosted, they change every minute. Um, so it's really difficult to keep track of those. But the behind all that technology and behind all that activity is a person. And that person, that actor is trying to do something. They're trying to accomplish something. So if you understand what it is they're trying to accomplish, and if you understand their motivations and what their overall goal is, you're basically able to strike a far longer lasting blow against these types of risks. You can take measures that have a far longer lasting effect, effect than merely playing whack-a-mole with industries that keep uh, in um, architectures and that keep changing all the time. So that's where our two types of intelligence fit in. Adversary intelligence is focused on tracking those actors, understanding who's, who's working with whom, um, who's planning or buying or selling or creating what. Um, whereas <coughs> malware intelligence is focused on tracking the same technology that they use. And the little arrow between those two boxes is actually very important. Uh, by tracking both, we have a very unique perspective. We can see both the the actor and the tool that they're using. And so you can look at a threat from both of these perspectives simultaneously. Now, where in those instances where you can link the actor to the, to the actual tool that they're using, you get that very complete overview of the threat, which allows customers and organizations to take a more proactive stance when it comes to mitigating cyber risk. And that's the whole point of cyber threat intelligence, to allow you to be proactive and get ahead of the curve. So we'll now kind of move into what is the cyber underground where we conduct all of our research. What's it actually like? And we're kind of in a very classic um, kind of that, that psychological experiment where um, they show you a picture of an, of an elephant and then ask you to think of anything but an elephant. Um, I'm going to tell you that it is absolutely not like an iceberg while showing you a picture of an iceberg. You often see that iceberg in kind of uh, kind of discussions around what people call the deep and dark web. Now, the iceberg is wrong, and the deep and dark web is also the kind of the wrong phrase, the wrong turn of phrase to describe the cyber underground. Um, firstly, the iceberg kind of suggests that it's massive, it's big. The underground, the dark web is very deep and it's hidden. Um, the truth is actually the complete opposite. It's actually fairly small and it's not dark or it is, it's hard to get into, but it's not dark. It's actually structured. You see, the reason for that is, and we'll quickly move on to what the, uh, to what the kind of the, the underground is really like. It's more like a marketplace. And the reason for that is that many of the threats that you're dealing with, many of the threats that you're worried about, that you're trying to mitigate, are not the work of a single actor or even a single group of actors. Rather, they're the work of groups of actors working together. Um, so groups of groups or actors working together, each playing a, a, being a little cog in a bigger kind of machine, in a bigger device. Um, call them business processes, um, call them kind of value chains, but each actor is a participant, they're part of a bigger whole, and they each, each actor or group kind of profits in some way, benefits from being a part of this, of this cycle or this process that's being constructed. And once you understand this, you understand that many actors and actors are always looking to kind of partner with others for the services that they offer. So actors are looking for people that are interested in what they have to offer. They are looking for particular other actors that offer a service or a product. And that means that they're looking for other actors that meet certain criteria. And a very deep and dark web doesn't actually help them at all. So the cyber underground is actually quite small um, and it is structured because the actors that inhabit it create that structure because that serves their purpose, because the whole purpose of the underground is to facilitate the buying, selling, designing, talking and discussing about products, services and goods. Products being things you buy outright, things like malware, uh, phishing kits, services being things you rent, bulletproof hosting, malware which is delivered as a service. So instead of buying software and having to deploy it yourself, you get it hosted as a service. 
Um, and goods are the intangibles. Um, they are the end result of the beginning for some of these value chains. So for instance, if you run a botnet that harvests stolen credentials, then those account credentials are the end result of all your efforts. Whereas if you're interested in, for instance, say big game ransomware um, attacks, it'll often start with credentials that give you access to something. So for you, the starting point would be buying account credentials from someone who's selling them. And that's the whole purpose of the cyber underground. And by tracking the top tier actors, who they're talking to, what they're up to, what they're offering, what they're buying, you kind of help, it helps you understand what may be coming. Um, but also once you see this kind of underground marketplace, and the idea is like a, a marketplace, there are specific areas that are focused on specific activities. So if you want to talk about bulletproof hosting, there are specific forums you can go to. If you're interested in um, account credentials, there are on a forum, there are particular discussion rooms that you can go to where people who want to, other actors who are buying and selling account credentials will hang out. So that makes it easy to find the right partner to work with. And that's the same way as a marketplace. In a marketplace, there are specific areas, there's specific types of products. Um, so that's why the cyber underground is actually, you can better think of it as an underground marketplace. <clears throat> to illustrate this, I have a hypothetical cycle. We call it the MIA cycle or the malware information and access cycle. Uh, as I said, it's a hypothetical cycle to kind of think about how these um, how these value chains may actually exist in the underground. I'm not saying that this particular one actually exists, but as a kind of way of thinking about it, a thought exercise, it's a nice way to show um, how the underground works. So let's say this is our core cycle, and we can either do all of the, we may be a group of actors and we can do all of this in-house, or maybe it's three different actors or three different groups of actors that have come to cooperate and work together. And what we do is we start at any point in the cycle, say with information, credentials. Those credentials give us access. The access allows us to deploy malware and that malware can harvest more credentials and the whole cycle repeats. And it's like a little flywheel. The more we do it, the better we get at it. The more kind of malware we deploy, the more credentials um, we harvest. Now there's kind of two questions that immediately pop up. One is, this is really nice, but we're only going around in circles. And the second is, how do you start? Because it's a circle, it has no beginning and no end. Well, this is where the underground comes in. Because of course we can enter and exit our little cycle anywhere we want. We can buy credentials to get started, but we can also sell excess access or access malware installs or access excess credentials in the underground. Um, so now we've formed a little cycle and we've actually found a way to profit from this. And others who want to repeat it have a way to, of getting started. But once we're doing these things, we can also engage in other activities on the side. So if we're stealing credentials um, or if we have access, well, we can start using that access to steal other types of data. Um, we can look at data theft. If we have access to things or if we have malware inside an infrastructure, we can use that malware to install additional malware. And when we have access and we're installing our malware, well, we can install a very particular type of malware, for instance, ransomware. So this cycle enables ransomware attacks. And finally, if I have a, a malware, an, an endpoint inside a network, which is which I, on which I've installed malware, I can control that endpoint by installing additional tooling. <clears throat> so I can use this as a platform, as a hopping off point um, to actually move laterally through an infrastructure and find the really interesting information or the crown jewels um, that we want to exfiltrate and steal. So this core MIA cycle actually also facilitates and allows all kinds of other cycles and all kinds of other things that we can do, monetize, um, and all kinds of other types of actors that we may come into contact that actually are of interest to us or are interested in the things that we do. And the underground facilitates all of this. So how do nation states and financially motivated actors fit into this? And why is there an overlap between the two? Well, before we go, before we go and start answering that, let's look at how long do we think this nation state thing has been going on for anyway? Since when have nation states been using um, kind of the, the internet to do spying and to engage in activities like that? Well, the answer, um, and it, the answer will be in the form of a reading tip. Um, here it is, The Cuckoo's Egg. It's a very interesting book um, by a gentleman called Clifford Stoll. And it is one of the first documented 
um, instances of both kind of hacking for profit and nation state spying on the internet. Um, it's the story and it plays back and it occurred actually way back in 1989. Um, the internet existed, the World Wide Web definitely didn't. Um, and the internet was actually mostly called um, still in its infancy, like ARPANET or um, connected networks of computers. And Clifford Stoll was an administrator at a US university, I believe, a laboratory. And they had a, 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 VAX, main, a, a VAX computer um, onto which um, students and, and other kind of university people would log in and run jobs, as it were. And um, the, the time it took would basically, um, you'd have to pay for that. The you know, various kind of faculties would have to pay for the computer time that they use. Something really interesting happened. It turns out there was a 75 cent discrepancy in the amount of time that the computer had actually spent and the amount of time they were billing for, a really small, weird error. Um, and Clifford decided that he wanted to find out what the cause of that error was. And he actually said, because it was so small, it had to be some really obscure bug and that piqued his interest. Well, it what turned out that it wasn't a bug. Um, it, the computer had been hacked and someone was using it um, to, move through the network and go to other computers. So it turns out that his computer, his university's computer had been um, had been hacked by a hacker who was using it to look for other US systems and was particularly interested in nuclear secrets. <coughs> this was actually one of the very first documented cases, not only of computer breaking, but after a long, long story, which is detailed in the book, um, they found the hacker and he turned out to be living in West Germany and working for the KGB and being paid by the KGB. So he was actually hacking for profit in the employ of a, a foreign nation state, in this, time, in this case, the Soviet Union um, and, a for, and a, uh, an intelligence agency. So the cuckoo's egg is really one of the first documented hacking cases, one of the first cases of computer espionage and one of the first cases. And even in those early days, you could see there being an overlap between financially motivated actors um, and nation states. So if we fast forward a little, about seven years ago, um, all the way back in 2015, I did a presentation. Um, back then we had the first appearance of, we, we already had um, appearances of things that we call APT, Advanced Persistent Threat. So we had the Stuxnet um, attack against um, Iranian, uh, the Iranian nuclear program, Flame, Gauss as well. On the cybercrime forum, the financially motivated forum we, uh, side, we had things like peer-to-peer -peer Zeus. Um, the target hack had recently happened. We had Anunak, um, who were basically targeting point-of-sale systems, but also banks in Russia. Um, and you could map these different groups out. And um, there's a very kind of, this is a very unofficial, call it a, a Gartner quadrant, um, where we have two axes, the technical complexity, um, and the motivation, geopolitical versus financial. And you can see the groups that are interested in malware or financially motivated. Those were moderately sophisticated, but very much interested in financial gain. And yet at the same time, we had the very highly sophisticated APT attacks um, that, were, that were interested in kind of geopolitical um, motives. They had geopolitical motives. Well, the prediction was, that we think those two groups will merge. We're now seeing these as two separate types of activity. We have what we call cyber criminals and we have APT. Um, but at some point, they're going to borrow tactics from one another. Um, and you will see APT groups starting to behave like financially motivated actors. And you will see financially motivated actors starting to borrow the same techniques that are now being deployed by nation states. Um, that was the prediction. And in 2016, um, and that didn't take long, we had the first SWIFT attack happen. Um, so if you remember the SWIFT attacks, the very first one was against the Bank of Bangladesh, um, an attack against the Central Bank of Bangladesh, where they tried to steal hundreds of millions of dollars in a very sophisticated attack. But the event, the, the motive was obviously money. They were after the money. But funnily enough, the attack itself was attributed to North Korea. So a nation state actor who was actually behaving exactly like a financially motivated um, set of cyber criminals, just a more sophisticated attack and the size of the, um, the, the amount of money they were trying to steal were slightly off. So that was the first instance where you really see that blending between nation state and financially motivated actors. And to be honest, that has continued ever since. And that leads us kind of to the myth 
Um, because if you ask people about nation state versus cybercrime, they'll actually often say, well, these two are completely different and separate. And that the cyber underground you talk about is almost exclusively populated and inhabited by financially motivated actors. Um, nation state are you can't you won't find nation state in the underground. Whereas in actual truth, they're not separate. Um, there are nation state actors in the underground. Not all of them, um, but you find a very significant portion of them actually do have a presence in the underground. And you can see that the distinction, the fine line where we say, oh, these two, two things are entirely separate is actually blurring. And sometimes it's really hard to tell, is this nation state financially motivated? Um, and there's actually even a complete overlap between the two where you have um, actors that are in both camps at the same time. Um, some of them, one day they'll be doing something which the, their motivation is financial and the next day it'll be um, nation state, but it'll be the same actor. And so we've got a couple um, of examples of this. And so we'll, we'll look at those. The examples that we've seen basically fall into a couple of categories. Um, we see nation state actors that are actually moonlighting a cyber criminal. So they have um, things they have some uh, stuff going on on the side where they're doing stuff for profit. Um, we've got instances of state actors, for instance, corrupt law enforcement, who are both directly and indirectly, and sometimes also security services, involved in cybercrime. Um, it's not on the side, they're basically doing this um, to earn money. And then you've got nation state actors that are engaging in cyber criminal or financially motivated activities but the actual beneficiary will be the state. So they're doing it for political or state um, objectives. And then finally, we see nation state actors that are actually working together, cooperating with or collaborating with um, financially motivated actors or cyber criminals as and when needed um, or when it makes sense for them to do so. So these are the various categories um, of this type of activity that we've seen. And I'll show you a couple of examples um, of each of them. So the first example, exhibit number one, um, will return to Lazarus. So this is that sophisticated group. Um, they've been around for a long time. They're still active today. And they've been very comprehensively linked to North Korean, uh, to the North Korean state. So they're nation state actors. Um, they shot to prominence with that first kind of attack. And they did a couple of others after that against banks and swift payment gateways. They were behind the Bank of Bangladesh incident, for instance. And their motive is purely financial gain. They want to steal money and the objective being to steal foreign currency to help fund um, North Korea's atomic weapons program, their missile program, and various others pro uh, other programs. So interestingly, what we have here is a nation state that is behaving exactly like cyber criminals. Now, North Korea has somewhat of a, a long tradition in this. They were doing this before the internet was around. Um, but um, in... Uh, in kind of, um, since the, the Lazarus popped in, we've seen them doing this much, much more. Lazarus, for instance, has also been observed targeting crypto exchanges and trying to steal large amounts of Bitcoin, for instance. Um, so purely trying to steal funds to kind of help fund um, North Korea's weapons programs, particularly its nuclear program. Now, the fun, the interesting thing is that um, this is an example of a nation state behaving like cyber criminals, but we have cyber criminals behaving exactly like that same nation state. In other words, um, Lazarus weren't the only ones targeting SWIFT gateways. While this, um, this spate of attacks happened a couple of years ago, um, you see other purely financially motivated groups that were also targeting SWIFT and other gateways and other uh, kind of organizations with similar tactics. So Cobalt, Anunak, Fin7, Bootrap and Lurk were all involved in these types of activities. So Lazarus were doing it on, as a, on behalf of the Korean nation state, North Korean nation state actors. But at the same time, we have financially motivated actors engaged in the exact same activity. Um, so if you're, if, you, if you're dealing with an incident on the SWIFT gateway, it becomes very hard to, to tell financially motivated from nation state um, in these incidents. Now, um, more than that, uh, talking about co-opting, we've seen Lazarus linked to the Russian-speaking underground. So there's been a couple of incidents where Lazarus um, was kind of implicated. It was, again, it was tied back to them. But in some of these incident, in the incidents, in the very early stages of the incidents, uh, incident, incident, another piece of malware was observed called Flawed Grace. 
Um, now, flawed grace is a very interesting and unique piece of malware, and it's uniquely used by another group called TA505. TA505 have been around for a very long time, still around today, um, and are purely financially motivated. They are interested in stealing money. Currently, they're engaged mostly in ransomware attacks. Um, but in these incidents, it seems that they obtained the initial access to a network, but then subsequently handed over that access to Lazarus. Now, we've looked at more of these incidents, and we've also seen some incidents where it's obvious that the um, Lazarus actors, the North Koreans, were linked to TrickBot. So what this tells us, and both TA505 and the actors behind TrickBot are established actors in the Russian-speaking underground. They've been around for a very long time. They're very mature. Basically, they get to pick and choose who they work with, and they won't work with just, just anybody. Um, they will only work with people they know who have a very good reputation. So what we can observe, what we can deduce from this is that North Korean actors maintaining a are maintaining a presence and are very well connected in the Russian-speaking cyber underground. So if needed, they can actually, um, and obviously they'll do this for money, but they can actually work with existing um, actors for the underground um, in their um, in, in their in, in what they're trying the, what they're trying to in the operations that they're running and basically we're talking about North Koreans um, up till now almost but it's not just North Koreans um, there's another category of actors um, namely Iranian nation state actors we've had several um, Iranian or Persian language actors in the underground that we know have links to um, the Iranian nation state. Um, BC Monster, for instance, is an example of this. Now, interestingly, this is a category of nation state actors who appear to be moonlighting as financially as cyber criminals. They're basically making money on the side. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the ones that we're tracking, actually, the role they have is they're sellers of network access um, in the underground. So there's a couple of actors that are prolific sellers of network access um, that actually turn out to be um, Persian or Iranian actors with ties to the Iranian nation state activities. And one of the things you can see that from is the type of targets that they sometimes come up with. Um, so they'll have targets in the US, in Europe, in defense, aerospace, um, in general industry, um, but also in hospitality. And a number of these actors have links to the Iranian Mabna Institute. Um, that's an uh, Ostensibly, it's a cybersecurity institute, but it's actually linked to the Republican Guard and it's part of Iran's kind of offensive cyber capabilities. Um, and we know that a couple of the activities that they were engaged in, for instance, was trying to track people abroad by um, attacking or hacking into airlines, hotels, and other um, even uh, government agencies to do with border controls, for instance, because basically if you can see passenger lists, you can see if a certain person of interest is on, will be on a flight or not. So that kind of ties neatly back to instance for their, uh, for their, when they're selling their access to their emphasis on the hospitality industry that links up with what we know the Mamla Institute um, is up to. So what it seems that they're doing is that basically after they're done with an access from a nation state perspective they sell it on the on the underground for profit maybe as kind of maybe this is kind of allowed as kind of a, a little side gig they have going um to earn money so this is kind of a nation state actors moonlighting in the underground the fifth exhibit is solar winds um the solar winds attack from um Dece it was December of 2020. Um, the, the attack itself was attributed to APT29, Cozy Bear, um, linked to um, uh, kind of Russian nation state. Um, to kind of jog your memory, SolarWinds is a, um, a company that makes software for man kind of managing networks of security software. And by hacking into SolarWinds, um, the attackers were able to deploy a version of SolarWinds um, using the update mechanism that gave them access to all of the all of SolarWinds customers. Um, so this is a very classical supply chain attack. It was a very sophisticated attack um, and uh, very well executed. So you think typical nation state activity um, and it took us until December 2020 to discover it. Well, actually in November of 2017, an actor called FXMSP offered access to SolarWinds for sale on the exploit forum. 
Now, there's no evidence that these two events are directly linked, um, but interestingly, they show that in December of 2020, we discover that a nation state has been uh, hacking into solar winds um, to use it for a supply chain attack linked to nation state. Uh, but actually in 2017, the financially, mo uh, financially motivated actor was already, had beat them to it. Um, so in that, uh, in that sense, this is where basically the financially motivated actors almost got there first. Um, FXMSP went on to sell many other accesses to many other uh, types of organizations. The actor kind of shot to fame when he suddenly appeared in the underground and offered for sale to uh, offered access for sale to what he claimed to be um, three AV companies, well-known large AV companies. That certainly piqued um, everyone's interest. So here, what we see is actually the what we call traditionally financially motivated actors having the exact same motivations, the, deploying the same tools and actually beating um, the, the sophisticated nation state actors to a particular type of, a, almost beating them to it um, in a way. And then exhibit six um, is the colonial pipeline incident. Um, so that happened in May of last year, we'll all remember it. Uh, colonial pipeline was hit by a ransomware attack. A crippling ransomware attack launched by the dark side ransomware as a service. It had this ransomware attack caused uh, Colonial Pipeline to shut down operations, especially pipeline operations, and that in, led to a fuel shortage in several states. And President Biden actually declaring a state of emergency. Now, this is interesting because this type of attack against critical infrastructure, a debilitating attack leading to fuel shortages, queues at the pump. Uh, the president having to put out statements and news conferences is typically the type of activity or what we would associate with a nation state attack. But yet this dark side is very much financially motivated. Um, they actually put out a statement to say as much. They said we are not politically motivated. Um, this is only it's a, it's purely about the money for us. That wasn't really aimed at colonial pipeline. It wasn't aimed at U.S. authorities. It was likely aimed at the Russian authorities just to kind of sell them we're not doing nation state attacks, kind of moonlighting, that kind of thing. This is just, it's just about the money. Please don't, um, please don't come after us. But what we see here is that this is an example of financially motivated attackers causing an impact which hitherto had been associated with a nation state cyber attack. So basically that, that prediction that the two would stand, start to blend back in 2015 is kind of one of the best examples where you have financially motivated actors causing the same amount, same impact that you a couple of years ago associate with a nation state attack. Um, and finally, we exhibit seven, and this is actually good news. We have the R evil arrests. Um, on January of this year, the FSB arrested 14 members of the Reval ransomware as a service at the behest of US authorities. Now, R evil again, are a ransomware group. Um, they're uh, behind a couple of well-known attacks. Um, one of the more well-known one is against meat processor JPS. Now, the interesting thing here is that this is a very rare example of Russian and US law enforcement cooperation. Um, for years, this really hasn't happened, that Russian law enforcement moves against known Russian cyber, uh, cyber criminals, for instance. Um, but in January of this year, they did. Um, they suddenly decided to arrest these 14 members and actually said in their press release that they did this at the request of U.S. authorities. So now before we before we say, yay, um, Russia doesn't extradite its citizens. So um, they've been arrested, but they won't be extradited to the U.S. to face trial over the, for instance, over the many ransomware incidents. But this all happened despite the rising tensions, and I think what happened yesterday is those tensions have been ratcheted up a couple of notches again, but this happened in the background of all these rising tensions over Russian troop concentrations near the Ukraine border. So it's a really odd timing to suddenly, after years of doing nothing, arrest 14 cyber criminals, unless you look at it as some kind of goodwill gesture um, from the Russians towards the, kind of towards the US. And that means that kind of in our nation state versus financially motivated actors, we now see cyber criminal groups almost being the subject of, of goodwill gestures. They're now quote unquote pawns in kind of nation state uh, games. 
This is interesting. And if you are a financially motivated actor, one of the top ones in the Russian speaking cyber underground, this is something entirely new for you to worry about. If if they want to make a gesture of goodwill, will they do that by arresting you um, and your um, and your other kind of group members? So this is an interesting new worry for them, and we definitely know that this is um, it's definitely led to some 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 kind of worries and tension, and people in the underground suddenly trying to reconsider their options, as it were. So. Why is all of this especially relevant today? Well, it goes back to, um, as you may have heard, there are some tensions at the Russia-Ukraine border. Um, there's been lots of speculation of what Russia will do next. Um, this slide is aging by the hour, as it were, because um, yesterday Russia did make uh, did make its move. But there's everybody agrees that there's a whole spectrum of options that can play out. Um, and cyber is actually very much a part of it. And even within that cyber realm, Russia has a broad range of options on how they want to apply cyber. And that includes co-opting normally financially motivated groups into working on their behalf to basically run very difficult to attribute cyber operations. Because if they're co-opted, and even, and even worse, are they co-opted or are they just being patriotic? Um, are they, do they believe that, that they need to strike out on behalf of Russia? Who can really tell? So because of this kind of unique blend between financially motivated and nation state actors, there's a whole broad range of ways um, in which things can go bump in the night, um, as it were, um, in cyberspace as a result of these tensions um, that are the direct result of that, of that blending. So to summarize, um, if someone tells you that nation state and financially motivated actors are separate, that they're two completely different groups and that you can't find that there's no nation state in the underground, um, I hope that this presentation has shown you that that's, that's actually a myth. Um, they're not different. Um, they've actually been blurring for years. They've been blurring almost since they started. That very first incident, uh, incident documented in the cuckoo's um, egg was actually a hacker that was, was being paid by a foreign nation state to find and exfiltrate US nuclear secrets. The, that trend is actually accelerating. Um, the more that uh, nation state attacks are documented, the tactics that they use, the more we see the underground trying to copy that, emulate those, but also the more we see kind of actors from nation state backgrounds making their way into the underground. Um, and also nation states using the facilities available in the underground um, for their own purposes. So we're seeing a massive borrowing and, sell and buying and selling of tools and tactics. Um, and we have the interesting, certainly in the case of the North Koreans, you have the interesting perspective of a nation state behaving exactly like cyber criminals because they are looking at cyber crime as one way to fund, um, for instance, their weapons program. And on the flip side, on the other side of that spectrum, we have criminals having impacts uh, which are actually indistinguishable from nation state impacts, almost like cyber attacks, the colonial pipeline um, incident, for instance, um, being uh, one of the best and most recent examples of that. So we've got Russians, Iranians, North Koreans, Belarusians, um, as we saw in the recent incident in, in Ukraine as well, and others, all active um, in the underground. And so basically, um, as the old Chinese uh, curse goes, may you live in interesting times. And from a cyber perspective, um, these are certainly very interesting times indeed. And with that, um, I'm going to say thank you very much um, for listening to us talk about the, uh, the overlap between nation states and financially motivated actors. Um, and I wanted to open it, um, open it actually to, to any questions. Um, there's a, um, there's a questions uh, box. If you have any questions, you can type those in. And we've got one. Um, it says, in the instances where access is handed off, um, do we think it is uh, criminals working with nation states um, of their own accord or that their country is telling them to do so or both? That is a very, very good question. Um, the We can't be sure, actually, is the honest answer. We can't be 100% sure, but um, we have a strong, strong kind of suspicion that um, they're not being told um, 
but that they're actually being paid, that this is a, a commercial relationship that they've struck up. Um, I think one of the kind of hints for that is um, earlier on, I said the North Koreans and the Lazarus group in particular were engaged in the SWIFT attacks. And right around the time that they were doing it, a number of finan purely financially motivated groups starting running very similar attacks. And the kind of the timing between the two was so close. And if you look at the tooling being used and the kind of the, the overall makeup of those attacks were so close that it's almost as if there was some kind of exchange of knowledge happening there. And that would, that would to a large extent kind of coincide with kind of regular underground activity where you see actors striking up a relationship and working together, uh, maybe selling on some of their tools um, or basically sharing tips and tips and tricks on how to how to do these things so and this case is so small and so isolated that it kind of looks almost as if um the the lazarus group made a very uh, attractive offer um, to ta505 and paid them for that access in a very simple um business um, kind of business transaction So if there are um, any, other, uh, any other questions coming in, let me just see. Um, there's one, um, do we, where do we think this is, where do we think this is heading? And um, is there any, oh, and is there a, is there a link to uh, the spate of ransomware attacks that we're seeing? Um, well, I think, as to where it's heading, um, I think we expect this trend to to continue. Um, I think as the it kind of continue and almost accelerate, um, I believe when the the maturity of um, kind of the the maturity and sophistication of the tools that are available in kind of the open cyber underground, um, kind of in the cyber underground in general, are now at such a level that even as a as as a the other nation states wanting to build a certain build an offensive capability, um, you can actually do a lot worse than start by using what is commercially available. Um, so I think that's one of the trends where you'll actually see the tools becoming so high of such high quality um, that you'll see other nation states simply dipping in and trying to use this. Um, the, the other part is also that you'll see more sophisticated, even more sophisticated states which have their own capabilities might actually also start using this because it makes attribution so very difficult. It's really difficult to see um, if something is a, is, is a tool uniquely used by a certain nation state actor, well, it becomes really easy to tie an incident to that actor. But if it's a broadly used tool um, and if you're and if you're a bit kind of if you if you if you muddy the waters a bit about what you're actually doing, for instance, um, the not Pecha attack was a ransomware attack, but it was actually destructive um, because what it was, it was a nation state attack against Ukraine. Um, however, the, the code itself got out, it got deployed in far more, far more locations than the attackers actually intended. But the whole purpose was it wasn't a ransomware attack. It was a destructive cyber, uh, cyber attack kind of masquerading as a ransomware attack. So from all these reasons, I think this trend of these two things starting to blend um, is going to continue. So I've got another question. Um, do we think that e-crime activity will drop while the Russian state sponsors actors are more active? Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I think the answer, I think because we don't really expect them to drop because unfortunately there's so much capacity kind of in the underground uh, that it can soak that up. And interestingly enough, we have been tracking this. And at the moment, a lot of the purely financial, financially motivated Russian speaking actors aren't yet, um, aren't yet, are, are basically continuing business as usual. Um, interestingly, a lot of the underground forums um, actually are pretty strict in the types of subjects that they will allow you to discuss there. A lot of it basically has to be, um, you'll see a lot of those forums, basically underground forums say, you're, we're, especially ones kind of the financially motivated underground, where they go, we're here to talk about things that help us make money 
and not about anything else. So if you want to talk about your, your car or your hobby, go somewhere else. And one of the other subjects that they basically say we don't want discussions about is politics. Um, so they're very much focused on the job at hand. Um, and right now it seems as if they're, they're still continuing with that. So for now, it seems there will be a, um, there'll, there'll be a it'd be kind of business as usual. What would be our advice for security analysts who are interested in keeping a track and on monitoring underground forums? Well, um, uh, the obvious advice, of course, um, would be to come talk to us because that's what we do. Um, but I don't want to make this, it's not supposed to be a, is it by something about knowledge sharing? What I want to, what I would say the advice is um, A, to be careful um, because the underground also likes to watch back. Um, and not just because they're trying to kind of unmask security analysts um, who are trying to track the underground, but basically um, there's lots of instances of kind of actors stealing from other actors. There's, a, there's lots of that going on. So to actually meaningfully um, track the underground forums is a heck of a lot of, it takes a lot, lots and lots of effort because that aspect of it is true. Um, there are barriers to entry. It's not as if you just kind of waltz in and um, um, everything is there. You need to kind of build these relationships. You need to have a um, you need to be need need to have a presence in the underground um, before you get um, you get to the to the really interesting bit. So it takes a a lot of hard work, um, and it takes um, also kind of knowledge of call it kind of the trade craft on how to conduct yourself in such a way. Um, that you are not unmasked, um, but at the same time that you you can kind of pretend to be one of them, so that you can kind of join in or kind of uh, be present at those discussions. So for those that want to want to do that, um, I would say one of the uh, one of the ways would be to look for people that can help you uh, to, that can help you do that, because it is an it is an, an acquired skill. And with that, I know that we are uh, kind of coming up on the uh, on the fifty minute mark. If there are no further questions, um, I will. Um, I would like to thank you all for um, giving me the opportunity to kind of bend your ear and tell you about the uh, the ways in which the um, the financially motivated actors and nation state actors are mixing and mingling, um, and um, for those, um, if you have any questions, by the way, that come up after this session and you think oh i wish i'd asked that one um my email address is up on the screen so um feel free to um to send me an email and of course <coughs> if you want to know more about what we do um or read some of our blogs um there is a um we did we actually did a couple of the blogs on where we can uh, on that on those instances incidents rather where we see that handoff happening between lazarus and ta505 um, you can find those on our websites under the blog section. section. And with that, um, I want to say thank you very much and um, would wish you all and please enjoy the rest of your day.